Hello, hello, my name is Keith Shengeli Roberts, and I am the lecturer for Information Architecture INF 2170H for the fall 2021 semester here at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information. Uh, this is the first of a number of pre recorded um, lectures relating to the subject of uh, information architecture. Uh, these will be in addition to the uh, live uh, video lectures that will be presented on Tuesday evenings beginning at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesdays. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, get started with uh, the beginning of this lecture. So as I say here in, this, in, in the, this first statement, information architecture is all around you. Uh, the real thing, however, is, you know, has it actually been intentionally designed or perhaps more haphazardly uh, put into place? What I'm really talking about here is, is the way that information has been organized uh, around you. And this doesn't just apply to things like websites, so that will be our chief, chief, chief focus here. It really does apply to all sorts of interfaces, and and this can be, um, you know, not just uh, various applications, but um, things that are around you in the real world. Um, a library, of course, would be a, a, a perfect case in point because uh, the all the the books and items within the library are organized in a specific way, and it's designed to help people, um, you know, navigate uh, physically in this case to around the library to find the material that they're looking for. The same can be said for even, you know, many types of, uh, if you go to a store, for example, in terms of how uh, the goods on sale are organized. And uh, and part of what we're trying to do with information architecture is to um, at basically help people under, understand the way uh, we see the world uh, in terms of um, seeing the underlying structure um, of, 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 the, of the data and content and how do we then help uh, people to find uh, better ways to help them find the information that they're actually seeking. Now, while this course is going to focus primarily on websites, I just want to say that upfront that IA really does apply to all sorts of other interfaces. One example of that, consider the drink options available for the Coca-Cola Freestyle. Now, if you're not familiar with this, this is a um, an interactive uh, prime, uh, touch screen based uh, drink dispenser that you can find in many sort of fast food outlets. And this, uh, what you're seeing here is um, uh, all of the uh, options uh, or the typical options typically uh, found um, by Robert Komplinski uh, when he's talking about how many soda combinations are there in a Coke Freestyle. And, and as you can see at the top, there are in fact uh, nine uh, separate options there at the top for regular style uh, sugary drinks. And uh, below that, I think it's about, I think it's about 12 or more um, for the low and no calorie options. And if you, if you take a look, there's um, uh, additionally, there's actually um, uh, in addition to the um, regular uh, sugar based options and the low, low calorie versions, there's also uh, quite a number of uh, uncaffeinated, uh, in other words, no caffeine versions of these same drinks. So that is a third sort of categorization for the for the material that's there. And the perhaps it's hard to make it out on your screen, but what's underneath that are individual flavors, which can in fact be added to the to the core to the to the base drink, so to speak. So under the initial uh, Coca Cola one. Um, there are options to add cherry flavor, raspberry, orange, vanilla, lime, or uh, cherry vanilla, for example. So these are all options that, that can be added to, as I say, the base drink. So when you look at this, this is, this is a whole lot of options. How do you then go about presenting this to the users so that they can successfully, you know, uh, pour themselves a drink and, and, and to do so in, um, you know, not a lot of time because people are, you know, often waiting in line to get to these types of machines and don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time trying to figure out the user interface just so that they can get uh, a, a particular drink. So the question is then, you know, like how would you go, go around re, uh, arranging, say, the user interface for the selection of choices to, to aid the user to get the drink they want? So 
it's interesting this this um developed over time here the original ui is what appeared on the left and it essentially focused on the brand with uh, the red coca-cola uh, button in the center for example and then once you clicked on let's say that particular button you'd then be presented with uh, not just the the main choice but then uh, the flavors at which could then be added to it um, now the interesting thing here that I, that I ought to mention is that um, it, uh, the reasons for adding the flavoring as I understand it um, was so that um, essentially uh, the manufacturer could could then go to um, local uh, retailers um, selling their pop in bottles and cans and so forth that you know we're finding a lot of people who are in fact uh, choosing say uh, cherry coke or vanilla flavored coke and would you perhaps like to stock that in your particular store so that they would get a sense as to what are the sort of regional um, flavor um, likes and tastes I should say of people in that particular area so there really was a kind of an emphasis from the manufacturer to um, you know to push the idea of like here are some additional flavors because then they could, um, they had the uh, the data to go out and, and try to sell those flavored versions of the drink to to local retailers. So that's part of the reason why there's a, you know, there, you have to understand that there's there's some some Im, Im, Im important um, information relating to you know why the flavors are there in the first place instead of just having, for example, the screen on the left that just has just say the the plain branded flavors. Now, having said all that, this is the, the first version, the first iteration of what was done. And again, based primarily in this case on brand. What then followed also primarily focused on brand, but it also made clear up front that there were different flavor choices available. So you still have the, the big red Coca-Cola button in the middle, but then uh, just immediately around it in a semicircle are the flavors which could then be chosen so cherry orange vanilla raspberry and lime uh, and then the other branded flavors um, sorry branded drinks ar um, um, uh, around it so again making it plain that it wasn't just coca-cola but but also emphasizing the fact that there were flavor options for you know again for the reasons that I that I, that I just talked about so again the, the, you see you see what's going on here they're now trying to emphasize that here's the other functions and I'm betting that what happened is that they were finding that people were simply going to the second screen uh, from the previous UI design and just going for the main for the main choice without even looking at the other options that were available. So, so, so saying this, this is this is another iteration of the design trying to, um, in this case, really trying to not only presumably to meet the needs of the users, but also in this case, the the manufacturer who is trying to push the different types of flavor options. Now, having said that, um, the, it then evolved into this this design, um, which it, which pre-COVID, you would most likely have seen this particular version. And, and it still is, is uh, still is kind of primarily available even these days. And this instead now focuses on the category of drinks. So in this case, as you can see here, nice big buttons, and this is animated, which can't really be shown here, but you, the little, um, little brand things would then, you know, sort of float into view, sort of saying that, hey, look, there's many options here. And you have now the option between all drinks, sort of showing you everything that's available, or you can go to the immediately to the low or no calorie type drinks, or the uh, caffeine free drinks, or the fl fruit flavored drinks in this particular case. So you, you might think that it's like, okay, this, this seems to be, um, you know, a fairly good outcome for, for all of this. Um, and it might appear to be the end game for UI development in this particular case. And certainly that, that's what I thought. Um, but now, of course, in a, um, uh, but thanks to COVID, you're now much more likely to see something like this. Um, so, you know, they, they've essentially now gone to uh, showing you the actual types of drinks and what, again, what you don't see here is this is an animated thing which then scrolls and shows you the various um, uh, types of drinks which are available um, and emphasizing the fact that, again, there's many different types of things that are available and now it's kind of a hunt and peck thing. But because the, the um, and one, one of the reasons for uh, 
kind of the de-emphasis of the actual touchscreen is what appears in the upper left, which is the contact-free pouring, which of course you can then scan uh, with your your the phone on your on your um, uh, the camera on your smartphone, and uh, then go ahead and. Um, you use the the particular web app to go and uh, show how to uh, uh, then then choose the in individual drink that you want. So so this gives you a contactless option, which then leads to a web page. And um, and uh, but having said that, it's kind of interesting because while it says on the nice sign beside the, the drink machine, no app required, there is in fact an app which is available. And what does that app look like? Well, um, I decided for the heck of it to, to load it up. <laughs> um, and I found that, um, now keep in mind, you know, you, you know, you're at a drink machine, presumably you're thirsty. And, you know, as time goes on with the, while you're loading this app up and, and working with it, you're presumably getting more and more frustrated. So I, I, I did this, it actually takes about seven to eight seconds to load. Um, <laughs> Which may not seem like a lot, but you know you're you're you know you're looking at your phone beside a, a drink machine, uh, and you may have people behind you like why is a guy looking at his phone if they haven't done this before themselves? Anyways, and and of course the first time you load it up, there's legal content that you have to sign off of, and then right away you get a, a list of uh, kind of a mysterious list like where did this come from of favorite drinks? And the first one being there a a, a Sprite Peach. Um, and having said that, uh, Sprite is not my favorite, and you know uh, I don't dislike peach, but it's not necessarily my favorite flavor. So you know this this is perhaps um, going going back a bit. This is now getting perhaps to be a suboptimal way of doing things, and uh, that seems to be uh, confirmed by the current rating for this particular app. And you know, really, is it any wonder? That given what I've just said, it's rated relatively poorly. Well, it is rated poorly by users. So as you can see, there's a lot of ongoing evolution in user interface design. A good information architect can help ensure that the design focuses on the user and their needs. How about this? Let's have a, let's have a look at a website that you're probably all uh, all familiar with. So this is from uh, the Amazon site website. This is the Amazon uh, Canada website. And as you can see, it has many, many categories. And, and actually the evolution of the um, Amazon uh, category selection is, is really quite something. It's been um, uh, it undergone many, many changes over the years. They've tried many different approaches to this, uh, which is kind of the reason why it's interesting to, to, to see what the latest version of this is. And as you can see, you know, despite the fact that most people uh, coming to the website are probably going to be typing in a particular thing that they're looking for, uh, nevertheless, uh, they do intend to, they do try to still categorize things to uh, make it easier for, for people to find, say, like items within their lar large corpus of uh, uh, data slash um, items to purchase. And you can see, as I say, there's many things here and clicking on all gives you this, this current listing. Um, everything from um, Alexa skills to, to watches, essentially. So as I say, it has many categories. Now let's have a look at this other website, this, this other website, which is Canadian Tire, and hopefully many people here are gonna be familiar with this as well also has an all category listing and um, but you can see that you know despite uh, showing all they are in fact not the same now this isn't too surprising because you know they're two different stores with two different intents of of um, in terms of the the goods that they sell so um, you know Canadian Tire for example does not sell books uh, at least not that I'm not that I'm aware of so that's not a major category for them that, that would be, for example, on the Amazon site. Um, so there's gonna be some emissions for sure, but it's interesting to see how um, like things um, may be organized. And you can do that by doing a side-by-side -side comparison. So um, again, uh, you know, um, the one on the left, which is uh, from Amazon, uh, you know, has Alexa skills, Amazon devices, Amazon warehouse deals. You wouldn't expect those things to be on the Canadian Tire website. Uh, same would be for perhaps apps and games. But then we have automotive. Ah, 
Now there, we have a one-to-one -one comparison. They're using the exact same descriptive category name for that particular section. But then going on, uh, looking down a little bit further, we have clothing and accessories on the Amazon site, and then clothing, shoes, and accessories on the Canadian Tire site. Hmm, okay, that's, that's kind of interesting. Okay, uh, and, and then looking further down, um, you know, what if I'm actually looking for, for shoes on the Amazon site? Well, uh, it's an alphabetical order, and sure enough, shoes and handbags are put together. So, you see, I, I wouldn't personally have thought of putting those two, to me, very different ideas together, but that's what they've done in this particular case. Perhaps that is, um, you know, under the accessories in the Canadian Tire area. I, I don't know if Canadian Tire sells handbags. I suspect it probably doesn't. <laughs> Um, but again, what, what's interesting is to see the where where they the, where they have similar categories, but they have some subtle differences. So um, notice on the Amazon side they have uh, tools and home improvement, whereas Canadian Tire uses tools and hardware. Um, uh, there's also um, let's see on the Canadian Tire site there is outdoor living, um, whereas the Amazon site actually has a uh, patio lawn and garden. So there's, it, it's essentially different ways of looking at and describing, in many cases, you know, similar types of categories, but there are some rather interesting differences there. Um, and I suspect that, you know, and, and, and understanding, you know, why are they different? Now, of course, a lot of this would have to do with the background of the companies and what they sell, but trying to you know figure out why things like the category names are different and you know and, and where where are these category names essentially the same and then figuring out the the differences and essentially the why between the two that's you know understanding that why is really what um what information architecture is all about so quick summary um of you know what, what we've just seen here keep it you know i want you to uh, to recognize that Organi organizational schemes are in fact everywhere, either designed or ad hoc or quite often a bit of, you know, combination of the two. Uh, you've also seen how designs may in fact evolve over time. And uh, the tools to navigate collections, such as the drop-down menus we saw from Amazon um, Canada and Canadian Tire, are also everywhere. They're there to try to help people find the, the things that they are looking for. And you have to keep in mind that these things need to be designed to address the needs of the users, the needs of the cultural and organizational context. In other words, the organizations or companies that are um, fronting the website or the UI for the drink machine, for example, and the content that is actually being organized. Now, the point of this course is to teach you to be sensitive to how we create information architectures, both in terms of designing a scheme for a collection and in terms of how we support people who use those schemes. And by the way, um, uh, if you found that last screen kind of hard to read, that's, if you thought that, that's good. You have the instincts, instincts of an information architect. Uh, that last screen was designed essentially to, um, to uh, to somewhat obscure the actual text a bit, and and one of the one of the focuses of an information architect who is advocating on behalf of users is things like accessibility, and that that certainly does come into play, and there will in fact be a, a whole module on that later in the course. So. Um, here is the basic uh, learning objectives, you know, um, a too long didn't read edition. We're going to be learning about information architecture roles, the various types of uh, roles that IAs can play. Uh, we'll try to um, uh, um, pass along how to understand information architecture problems uh, as they're presented and then how to systematically apply IA principles to address a particular information architecture problem and then create prototypes that illustrate how to, uh, an, an information architecture and essentially to take uh, something that is existing and then to hopefully improve upon it with the idea that you are um, there to, as they say, um, help the users um, better uh, navigate through the information that may exist on a sample website. And I just wanna emphasize, this is a very hands-on course. 
you will in fact be given a number of professional tools um, that um, that that um, uh, practitioners will uh, use all the time to be able to um, you know systematically um, take a look at the um, the information structures on things like websites to um, then you know essentially dissect and uh, dissect those websites and get a better sense as to how they work and uh, also potentially who uses them and and then uh, from uh, all that data will give you the the processes and analytical uh, tools to then go in and come up with ways to improve upon uh, what is uh, what currently exists so now let's talk a little bit a little bit about myself you're probably wondering who is this guy who's already been talking to me for about 20 minutes here uh, I am the lecturer on information architecture here at the UT and I've been I've been teaching this uh, this topic since uh, 2004 uh, in terms of my academic background um, I have a bachelor's in English and another in psychology and a master's in public administration all from Queens and um, you know uh, that may seem like an odd combination for uh, getting into uh, for getting into this particular field and, and keep in mind there was no no equivalent uh, for this back uh, when I graduated uh, last century um, though the, um, uh, the in information on psychology that was a, a focus on ergonomics and um, that translated well to uh, the area of the web which is where I started working back in the mid 90s and as I say a more on that later uh, I'm very much a longtime practitioner of information architecture and um, an offshoot of it called content strategy. And I've worked primarily as an independent consultant in this area, though I'm currently now working for the semiconductor firm uh, AMD. Uh, there, there's a lot of work I need to, uh, that, that, I, <laughs> that I've been asked to do there. Uh, a bit more about me um, I actually live in London Ontario uh, so that's why these uh, that's a good chunk of the reason why these lectures are being uh, pre-recorded I will I'm not planning on actually uh, being uh, in a physical office within the Bissell building on the U of T campus uh, because that's a you know a good um, two plus hour drive away and, uh, and and I've already been teaching this course virtually for for some time now uh, I live here in London with my partner Dawn and her, her green-cheeked Kanyar Krishna, who you see pictured on the right, uh, and and his and his particular girlfriend. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so we have we have a pair of green-cheeked Kanyars, and I mention this because uh, they are cute, but um, they can be a bit on the noisy side, and there is a chance you will occasionally hear them in the background uh, during probably uh, more during the the live lectures. Um, I also have, in fact, two grown daughters, uh, one, one of whom was already uh, graduated with a uh, degree in illustration and uh, the other who is currently in third year at uh, the University of Windsor. Um, and uh, in, ca in case you're curious, my hobbies include things like um, reading and I also like to write. Um, I'm interested in history, um, interesting, uh, pretty much all, all types of history. Uh, I like doing photography. I have some uh, some interesting uh, photography credits. Um, I have a um, I have a, got a Discovery Channel credit. One of my stills was used for one of their shows. Um, similarly, for a, a National Geographic um, documentary as well. So it's it kind of cool to have those credits under my belt. Uh, and um, I also like collecting coins, and I've specialized into a particular rabbit hole of uh, Canadian pre-Confederation tokens. So what you see immediately below that is a what's known as the uh, Bouquet Sioux um, token issued in what was then Lower Canada in what I believe was I think it was the 1850s, if I remember right. And yeah, that's that's a whole other rabbit hole. That, uh, anyways, uh, I, I I expect no one in this class will. Uh, know much or anything about that but you know I'm, I'm interested in a fair amount of fairly obscure things I guess um, the picture uh, you see on the right of the uh, it's actually the Rosetta Stone uh, I have an interest in ancient uh, Egyptian history as well and that is actually a re reconstruction that I um, that I devised of the original um, Stella that it was a part of so the the, the picture is of the uh, Rosetta Stone which is currently in the uh, British Museum uh, in London England 
and and of course it's it's a fragment of of, of a larger piece uh, which was originally a proclamation uh, from the um, from the uh, contemporaneous pharaoh and what is missing is you know essentially what what you see here it just it's just showing that this is part of a fragment of this and why i'm mentioning this is that um, I co-wrote a good chunk of um, the Rosetta Stone article along with a uh, with along with a, philolog a philologist and an expert on uh, on languages, and we were at, and this is part of a, a contest, and the British um, Museum actually gave us a, a, a prize. In my case, it was a, a book uh, <laughs> for doing this. Anyways, this is this is just to say that yeah, I'm interested in in, in a bunch of uh, fairly obscure things. So um, uh, I guess that's why I'm a bit on the quirky side. But but there you go. All right. Uh, I, I also should mention that um, I've also written a number of books on uh, web technologies, and you can probably make out from the the images there yeah they're they're kind of dated um they are written primarily in the um, mid to late 90s early 2000s and um these days about every other year i get a check from the publisher for that is about the equivalent of um maybe a, a good um, um grande cup of of uh, chai from say the local Starbucks. So um, um, uh, 20 years on, it doesn't actually pay a whole lot, but but it, 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 it's interesting to have have those book credits. Um, I also contributed a chapter on the Darwin information typing architecture, of which I'll be talking more about later, to uh, current practices in technical and professional communication back in 2017. And I also run an industry blog that applies information architecture principles to documentation. That is the ditterwriter.com website. Please feel free if you want to have a look at that site. Okay, um, in terms of how to contact me, I'm recommending people uh, reach out to me via, um, in fact, uh, my direct email, which is robertsk at rogers.com. I've been having some issues of late with my U of T email. So uh, just um, just to make sure that uh, people can get a hold of me directly, please just use that particular email. That's it's also um, on the syllabus if you want to uh, go and check that. Um, uh, similarly, if you um, want to, um, um, I, I, I encourage this for for all of the students who are taking this course. Um, if you're at all interested in using uh, the connections I have, and I, I have, you know, inadvertently ended up being one of these um, sort of super connector connecting people on on LinkedIn. I have, I think it's like over 500 contacts or what have you. But if you can, if if you, I I don't, you know, if you let me know that you are a student of this course, um, I never ever turn down um, any any student request to link on LinkedIn and. You can then uh, hopefully leverage uh, my my number of contacts to, um, you know, go out and 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 uh, help help um, yourself in terms of uh, uh, future uh, job ambitions. So so again, that's that's why I'm, that's why I mentioned it here. Please please feel free to reach out to me and yeah, connect so that you can you can uh, leverage the connections I already have. And in terms of my office hours, it's um, I, I have it basically for uh, a half an hour to an hour immediately before scheduled class time. Um, but I'm also available to chat online at say prearranged time. So um, I do in fact have a uh, a nine to five job, so to speak, and I and I I'm tend to be unavailable during that time frame. But I do want to say that you know outside of that, yes, I'm I I, I certainly am, am available to to chat if 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 uh, if, you, if you want. Now, now normally this this next slide would be done actually in class, and this is where I get a quick poll as to where you know the individual students are and what their particular interests are uh, are with within um, in, in and in taking this particular class. So um, I, I, there, I I would assume that a number of you are taking the uh, user experience design con uh, um, concentration. Uh, but I'm, I'm assuming that there you know, there are students who are also taking uh, the other uh, other sets of streams within the Faculty of Information. All I'm all I'm hoping for is that you have an interest for interaction design and human computer interaction (HCI) um, when when taking this course. I, I'm I'm hoping also to spur and a real interest in this particular topic, and that when whatever uh, role you end up going on to after this, that um, you know, you will think um, um, in terms of how to uh, be an advocate on behalf of end users for 
the information systems that you may be working with in the future. There is one required textbook for this course, and that is um, the Information Architecture for the Web and Beyond published by O'Reilly. And it, it's uh, uh, written by uh, Louis Rosenfeld, Peter Morville, and uh, Jorg Arango. Uh, and this is from 2015. So I have to say, you know, like this is, in fact, getting just a little bit long in the tooth. But having said that, the fundamental underlying principles of information architecture are all really nicely spelled out in this book. So while it may not capture all of the the latest and greatest developments relating to, say, um, mobile um, um, uh, mobile web design and and um, uh, and making that work again for for end users. Um, it does have does set up the the architecture <laughs> for uh, so to speak for, um, for 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 all for um, for how that should all be all all be done. So so the the basic principles are really all kept in this in this particular text. It is a terrific text. Um, um, I've been. Um, I, I have um, been buying each edition as it has come out, and um, it's it's really uh, the first edition is very much dog-eared from from all of the <laughs> all the times I've had to go back and, and look up look up particular things while I've actually been you know trying to do actual work um, based on the principles in it. So it it is very much a classic. Uh, this and by the way, I was actually uh, in a situation where. Um, I was listening in on an interview being done by one of the principals. I think it was Peter, Peter Morville in this particular case. And uh, he's, uh, there is no plans to do a fifth edition of this. So, so this is um, likely to be the, you know, still going to be the, the key text for this for some time to come. Now, this is known in the business as the Purple Polar Bear book. And that's uh, for obvious reasons here. Um, though uh, uh, why it's made distinct is that uh, all previous editions um, use the color green instead of purple, as you see here. So, you know, um, it, it sort of di purple distinguishes it from the previous editions. There will also be other assigned material, so um, so please expect additional readings plus online videos. For example, um, I just sort of want to po point this uh, this your way uh, on YouTube is the uh, Nielsen Norman group and uh, they do a lot of very interesting and you can see here very short videos um, focusing on aspects of information architecture. I, I really do recommend it and there are some cases where I'll be pointing you to specific videos um, that, that touch on uh, interesting uh, points throughout the length of the course. Now now I want to talk a little bit about online teaching. Uh, now, you know, previously, um, you know, prior to COVID, this was a new experience for myself. But now this is the, you know, the third such time I've been able to teach this in the past uh, year and a half. And um, having said that, I'm expecting that probably, you know, most of the students for this course have already gone through uh, some version of online experience. But I re recognize that for some, you know, for, for, uh, especially for those who may be returning to school after some um, after some absence, that this may be a first for, for, first for some. And actually, the plan for this is um, to have a mix of pre-recorded lectures like this one, along with uh, live video lectures, um, which will be done as I said on Tuesday evenings, plus um, live in person. Um, studio sessions. Now that is, as I speak, still being worked out um, in terms of the actual days and hours, but the plan is to have, uh, um, and I, I don't think it's necessarily going to be exclusively live sessions, but certainly that is the intention at this point. And as I say, you know, please, please stay tuned, uh, you know, take a look at the syllabus and for announcements in particular on Quirkus relating to what's going to be happening there. Uh, there is also an expectation that this, that um, U.S. students will uh, assemble yourselves into groups, and in this case, primarily virtually for the projects that you will be working on together. The type of work that will be done is not the sort of thing that can uh, easily be done by uh, a single student alone, and in, the recommendation is that people within the within the uh, the uh, the class uh, arrange themselves into groups of 
ideally five or six people to properly um, handle the the workload that that's required for these for the various projects. Um, one thing I, I also want to emphasize here is that you're going to be producing a real portfolio of information architecture work. So, um, you know, the assignments are there to help you build a portfolio for possible work in the field if that's of interest to you. Um, and having said that, I, I've been in the sort of fortuitous position of, um, you know, helping to recommend students to uh, potential employers. Um, I've I've even been uh, in a situation where, um, well, actually, uh, uh, this has happened a, a couple of times now, where I've been working for a firm and uh, the name of a student has come up and I've been able to enthusiastically um you know recommend them for a role within the company um based in part of on the work that they have already done uh, which has actually gotten them to the stage where they actually would then come to my attention i mean they they had already jumped through a number of hoops to get here and and that is at least in part of uh, because of the portfolio that you can build while you know doing the work in this course this this is as i said earlier this is uh, you know there's going to be a lot of hands on on work uh, with the professional tools uh, that we'll be providing you and 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 with that as i say you can um you know um uh prospective employers uh will will find you know you, this may in fact give you a, a leg up so to speak when it when it when it comes to other people who are applying for positions now having said all of that even if this isn't your goal the takeaways from this course really should serve you well across other types of disciplines now I also have to, I'm putting on my grumpy face here, you have to have to realize that uh, I have to talk about um, academic offenses. Now all the work you submit really must be your own, not the work of another student from this term, a student from a previous term, a friend, a tutor, an online source, etc. And your work must not be submitted by someone else, save for the group assignments where one person in your group is going to be passing it all along on behalf of the other members of the group. Now, having said that, I've been teaching this course for a number of years. I think, in, you know, I haven't uh, seen and read absolutely everything that needs to be marked, but um, I, I'll almost certainly recognize things that have been uh, taken from other, uh, other, other courses. So, you know, please don't do that. That is not a good thing to do. Um, now. Also, please don't look at another assignment solution. This includes going on, uh, looking for one online. And now I also have the thing about never show another team your work that comes with an asterisk. And I'll just finish what I've got here. So this applies also to drafts and incomplete solutions. And you know, discuss how to solve an assignment only with the course instructor. Now, having said all of that, I want to. The reason for the asterisk there is that this is all on the assumption that you know there may be more than one group who may be uh, who are working on the uh, the same target website i am really hoping that that is in fact not going to be the case um in the past we've actually uh, when when two groups have wanted to work on the same target website what we've done is essentially um, i flipped a coin and then you know one of those two groups will then go on to focus on the the, the website that they won and the other one has to then uh, go and choose a different website um so there you know the the chance for a lot of actual direct copying becomes um significantly less in that circumstance um and having said that i i would actually encourage uh groups to actually take a look at um uh, you know like uh, there will be occasions within the studio sessions where it would be good for groups to actually you know discuss amongst themselves as to the approaches that they're taking for their particular target website so all i'm really saying here is you know please don't copy slash plagiarize uh, work direct work from another group but yeah sharing ideas that's that's not a bad thing at all so again just just please don't keep that in mind my commitment to you is that uh, I certainly hope my lectures will be well organized. I'll do my best to make the lectures clear and hopefully interesting. All electronic materials from the lecture will be posted to Quercus. Um, this, these will, um, these particular pre-recorded lectures will also be posted to uh, YouTube, and I will be making announcements as to where you can you can find them. Um, 
part of the reason why they're they're posted to something you, like YouTube is that um, there you can easily stream, you can pause them, you can do what what have you. However, um, what's come up in the past is that there are some students who may not have ready access to something uh, like YouTube, which is why I make the video files downloadable. Um, so that they can then be watched, um, you know, have to download the large files. That can't be, that can't be, um, uh, there's nothing to do about that, but, um, but then you, you, you actually then have the file and don't have to worry about being able to connect to, to YouTube or not. Um, I also want to be respectful to you, your time, and uh, also to answer your, your questions with uh, uh, alacrity and, um, you know, and, and, and um, you know, uh, and with respect. And uh, I will also do my very best to keep up with the emails that you send in. My expectations of you is to please be respectful of myself and your fellow classmates. Please read the weekly assigned readings. Uh, keep up with course resources such as Quirkus, um, uh, look at the syllabus, readings, announcements, etc. Uh, and of course, this really goes without saying, but I'll, I will say it again, don't cheap copy or plagiarize. And of course, laugh at all my jokes. Uh, I am a dad. I have a lot of dad jokes and even, yeah, yeah, uh, okay, I, 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 yeah, dad jokes, yeah. <clears throat> uh, the other thing I want to uh, point out um, uh I've, I have, in fact, worked uh, as a uh, technical copy editor in the past. So um, grammar uh, and spelling are really um, key things for me. And keep in mind that I, I while yes, I'm going to be the professor for this course and I'll be, I'll, I'll be looking at the assignments, I am very much, um, I, I, I want you to think of it as, as if you are putting in reports um, for a professional client, for example. Like if you're doing IA work for a client, you definitely do not want to have grammar issues and um, spelling um, mistakes and typos in the content that you hand in. So the expectation is that you'll hand in material that will meet the expectations for a graduate level class. I highly recommend you, you either designate somebody in your group as uh, a proofreader or um, find somebody outside of your group who can then proof your, your content before you um, submit it. Uh, because uh, poor grammar and spelling will not get you an A no matter how good the assignment. Okay, and now let's start by having a look at the evolution of information architecture. And this is a, as you'll see, a somewhat personal journey. So in terms of my overall work in the field as an information architect, well, I started work as a webmaster at Del Rena all the way back in uh, the mid 90s. And from, yeah, and that webmaster, that's, a, <laughs> that's not a term you actually see much these days, but um, that, was, that was the reality back then, brand new, brand new way of uh, describing what was, what was being done back then. And this was um, from having, um, you know, I come coming to this from uh, actually working on um, some very early um, software uh, related to internet technologies. I learned the beginnings of HTML um, and and also uh, server technologies that related to serving web pages. And I just sort of fell into the role of of being a webmaster way back when. Uh, I used, um, I was then a webmaster working for Symantec, which was a, then, which bought out the company that I was then working for, and then moved on from there to, uh, to Quest Software. Um, realizing that um, there, you know, there's a lot of in rather interesting problems in the field of how do you then present information on the web to users, I, I started looking into uh, the realm of what would then later be called information architecture. And I was called an information architect at uh, Digital View, um, then working for ATI, and then at AMD. And oddly enough, I'm actually now back at AMD, um, pretty much in, in that same type of role. Um, I've also spent, as I said, much of the past 10 years or so working as an independent consultant slash content strategist at various consulting firms such as Mecon, Yellow Pencil and Precision Content, um, and also for, for Ixiosoft. Um, Ixiosoft is a component content management um, uh, system manufacturer, and they had a need for trying to um, you know, essentially better understand the needs of, of their own particular users. And I, I was in some ways trying to help guide with, with the UI, but also the information on their website and understanding the, the particular um, market 
um, of of potential users and buyers of their software, which sort of rolled into the um, part of the content strategist function. I also work with the standards body Oasis on open standards development, including the um, uh, being a member of the Data Technical Committee, uh, which is helping to set the standard for the next Data uh, XML 2.0 standard. If you don't know what that is, um, I will be talking a little bit more about this in, in, in the course. In fact, even I think a little bit more in this uh, particular class. Now, it's important to know that the applied process of information architecture is, is you know, fragmenting. Its techniques are now being applied in other, you know, related fields, including things like enterprise content information architecture, IA practices specific to things like, say, SharePoint, and to things like, you know, specifically to intranets, because there are there are different uh, potentially technologies at play, different types, different types and sets of, of users who are using using the material and accessing the material. Um, this can include things like, say, voice uh, um, uh, user experiences relating to things like, say, virtual assistants. And the idea of, say, pervasive information architecture, which applies IA principles to our environment, both virtual and real. So as we're increasingly immersed in data, information architecture techniques are being used to help find what information we want, when and where we need it. But then you need to think about, well, you know, how did we actually get here? How, what are we supposed to do? Where are we going? And how do we get there? Uh, all <clears throat> in terms of uh, uh, information architecture. So as um, maybe the late great Carl Sagan said, you know, you have to know the past to understand the present. So that's, that's what we're going to be looking at. And really where the term information architecture comes from, it, it's, it started from a presentation that Richard Saul Werman uh, did at an architectural conference. And this is not information architecture, this is you know actual building with, with bricks and mortar um, at an architectural conference back in 1976. And while he did actually work as an architect under uh, the famed architect Louis Icahn, he ended up spending much of his career on data visualization and how to communicate these ideas effectively. So in the top left there, you actually see uh, one of his um, architectural, um, you know, an actual building that he did back in, I believe, the, the mid to late 60s. Um, let's just say that, uh, you know, I mean, this is very much my opinion, um, that he was probably a better information architect in many ways than, than an architect from, from what I've been able to read. So that, you know, that's, that's purely my opinion, but, and from, from the, information that I've, uh, that I've read that kind of kind of bears out but but what he ended up doing was was interesting is that he was looking at how to present information on as they say here data visualization so on the lower left is one of his visual guides um, looking at in this case you know like what are you know the types of equipment that are used in this case in an intensive care unit and you know instead of having a, a picture um, or, you know, a set of diagrams, he's basically in this, you know, two-page layout looking at all of the various um, types of equipment and how they all work together um, in an ICU, um, you know, to help explain how, how all of this process works to the layman. Um, he also ended up coming up with the um, access guides to various cities, see the, the cover here for London, and the innovative thing that he did with these particular guides was, you know, presenting information in a what was arguably a more intuitive way at the time by, you know, sh sh by uh, dividing up information by, you know, uh, by areas that people might be say, staying within. Like here you are at hotel. What's in the immediate area? How do you get from A to B? Um, some of the work that he did on the types of subway systems, for example, that appear, you know, the, the maps that, that appear in these guides are, you know, um, you know, still some of the best that have, that have been created. And he was also the, basically the instigator for, for TED Talks. If you've, so if you've ever seen a TED Talk, you can um, uh, thank or perhaps blame this Mr. Workman. Now, this is one of the seminal books of the information architect field, Richard Saul Werman's information architects from 1996. 
and it looks at information architecture from the perspective of visualizing static, static data effectively. But some of his core ideas were really more generally applicable. So his definition of information architecture, and that, you know, that, that's a picture of, of the fellow right there. Here we are here. Here are the, 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 his three major points. One, the individual who organizes the pain, pa patterns inherent in data, making the complex clear. The, sorry, another water break. A person who creates the structure or map of information, which allows others to find their personal paths to knowledge. And also the emerging 21st century professional occupation addressing the needs of the age, focus upon clarity, human understanding, whoops, and the science of the organization of information. And we're going to now look at each of these points in turn. So, starting off with the first one, the individual who organizes the patterns inherent in data, making the complex clear. And, you know, I would argue that people have an innate ability to seek patterns wherever they look. So here we are, a few sample pictures. Um, you know, there's the um, uh, uh, picture of a, of a, of a man by uh, the artist uh, Arcevoldo. There we have the face vase illusion. And, uh, you know, the Rorschach uh, uh, ink block number three, one of, one of many. And, you know, what's going on there? Well, that interpretation is, of course, up to you. But, you know, many people see butterflies. Many people see, uh, say, two men in, the, in, in there as well. Um, perhaps uh, something like, say, a, uh, uh, the head of a grasshopper. You know, and, and it's, you know, these are just in random ink plots. It's, it's entirely up to, you know, your own perception as to what you read into the image. We even see ourselves reflected in things like the hat in the night sky. This, is, this particular uh, conjunction shows Jupiter, Venus, and the moon, and this is known, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, as the happy conjunction, because, you know, we, you know it, the, 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 the crescent of the moon appears to look something like a smile, and you have the the two planets, which uh, conveniently look a bit like eyes, so uh, you know, we, as I say, we, we see ourselves reflected in the sky, and this is not just this is not a new thing. Far from it. You know, the ancients, uh, the ancient Greeks, Romans, um, you know, Chinese, um, Mayans, you know, all saw in the stars various types of collections of you know, often people and the, the mythologies that um, uh, that um, you know were part and parcel of their society. Uh, you know, in terms of in terms of the, the stories that uh, their their origin myths. So you know, for example, here you know, um, here is for example the constellation Orion, and you know, you have the 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 stars on the left hand side, and you have the uh, depiction of the constellation on the right. Ancient astronomers noted the cycles in the sky, and they built devices both to track and record them. So you see a star clock from the tomb of Ramesses the sixth. Uh, Stonehenge and uh, say the Nebra sky disk showing some clear indications of you know what what's been interpreted as say the the sun and the moon and uh, potentially you know um, as things like say the Pleiades which is a star cluster sort of in the um, uh, in the central portion of the disk. But there was a need not only to record patterns but also to predict them, such as knowing when a solar eclipse would happen or where the moon and planets would be on a given date. Prediction and interpretation of the data was necessary to better understand the patterns that were observed. So one of the first attempts to come up with a device that could predict the motion of the moons and planets was likely made by a pupil of Archimedes prior to 85 uh, BC. This is known as the Antikythera mechanism. And you can see the, the rusted remnants of this, which uh, currently is in, uh, resides in a museum in Greece. And you know, this is arguably the first known attempt of an analog computer, and it had a fairly sophisticated display, essentially a, a form of user interface. Most studies focusing on the device have been on its workings, but recent x-ray techniques have revealed more about its you know, display, it's about its UI. So the Antikythera mechanism is not notable also in that it not only tells the user where the planets will be, but describes how they work, mimicking the retrograde Plan, uh, paths of the planet. So um, what you see in the upper left is the, the path that a planet actually traces through the sky because um, the way the Earth moves 
it sometimes um, you know gets ahead of say an outer planet, and it sometimes it, it seems like a kind of like say Mars or Jupiter will go backwards you know, if you look at it over several nights in the sky. So that's why you get sort of this looping motion. And I have a couple of videos here, and uh, sadly they do not work within this particular presentation. So I'll just um, they are demonstrations as to how the Antikythera mechanism works. And you know it's a bit of an offshoot, but again think of this from the the idea of of a user interface in terms of how to look at and interpret the information that's provided. Now you might be wondering, well, you know, hey, what about mechanical clocks? But they actually come a lot later. How you know, basically the 11th century A.D. Clocks are also, when you think of it, abstractions because a clock tells you time, but does not, you know, essentially tell you about time, whereas, say, the Antikythera me mechanism talks to you, you know, talks about, you know, when and where planets will be at a particular point in time and provides an idea, and an, an analogy as to how and why these things come about. So it's possible to think of the mechanism as the first dynamic data visualization. It's a dynamic map, not just showing where things are, but interprets how they work. And another way data has been described visually that everybody here is going to be familiar with is via map. So uh, in, in, in the top left, this is uh, one of the first known um, um, maps that show a, a portion of the New World uh, in, in the left, which is basically um, part of the East Coast and essentially Newfoundland. Speaking of Newfoundland, there's a, a lovely map of, um, of, uh, of Newfoundland um, on, on the right-hand side. And then, of course, a, a, a map of the world. You can see that um, um, this, you know the uh, Europe and Africa is fairly well charted out, but uh, South America and North America, well, you know, still still had a little ways to go. So the you know the point being is that you know maps are a way of um, essentially uh, letting us know what's out there and how to navigate between point A and point B. Now the interesting thing is that it took you know. Uh, you know, quite a bit longer. Uh, it, it took a, it, it took until essentially the uh, um, the uh, 19th century for people to start thinking about maps um, to show more than just geography. And um, probably the best known early proponent of this is Charles Joseph Menard, um, who lived from 1781 to 1870. So in this particular map or set of maps. It shows the effect of the U.S. Civil War on the cotton trade in Europe. So if you take a look at the one uh, on the left from 1858, essentially you can see the essentially the, the, the maps. And, you know, the, in some ways the, the distorted-looking continents are not necessarily you know, as important as the data that's uh, provided on them. Notice, see, for example, you know, the, the relative huge size of England as opposed to the relatively small size of, of the whole entire continent of Africa. So clearly, you know, exact geography was not something that Menard was trying to strive for, at least in this particular case. So what you see in blue is, is the, uh, the, the amount of cotton that was exported prior to the Civil War in the States to essentially the cotton mills in, um, in England and in continental Europe, primarily. And then in yellow, you see the exports um, primarily for, uh, of, of cotton coming from India. And then lo and behold, what happens in 1864, in, um, you know, in, the, in the beginning of the U.S. Civil War, and uh, the cotton exports dry up. Um, England, uh, England's mills still need to have the raw material, so as a result, what this is showing is that essentially India has uh, taken over, for the most part, in terms of delivering the supply the supply of, of necessary cotton to feed the mills. And then um, by 1865, you know, things have reco recovered somewhat, but notice that the, the main supply from the states is coming from the, you know, the southernmost area from essentially uh, the, the area of, um, uh, from, from the Gulf of Texas, um, and certainly not from places uh, north of that that had already been captured. Um, things had in fact improved to some extent, but from that point on, essentially, um, India was really the main provider of cotton. So again, what you're showing, what we're being seeing, what we're seeing here is essentially, you know, a way of looking at different types of, of, of information that's being put onto a map. Menard was a civil engineer who created these maps that graphed 
additional information on top of the geography. So here's another case. Here is French wine exports for 1864. So everything is coming out um, from, from France, which again is uh, uh, rather large compared to <laughs> everything else because he, he had to, you know, show all the places um, from the country where the, information, uh, where the wine was, com uh, was being sent out from. And then all the places that it was going to. So uh, you can see the New, uh, uh, New York being one of the primary places in, say, North America. A whole lot to London. A whole, um, a whole lot to various ports on um, the uh, to the north of France and to uh, Alemania, meaning meaning uh, in Germany, but also Belgium, which is not depicted in this case. Um, a, a lot to uh, say Italy and to Algeria and quite a bit, uh, you know, surprise, surprise me, quite quite a bit to uh, South America as well. So again, you know, the point of this is that he's, you know, providing information at a glance to people who are trying to understand. You know, you, you have a, you have the graph uh, in the upper right, which essentially has the same information, but it's, but you look at something like this and it's like, oh, so you know, that's. That's where all the, the French wine exports for that particular year are, are, are heading to, primarily. And his work would then lead on to, you know, the burgeoning field of data visualizations. Um, so what you have on the you know, left is uh, this, uh, from informationisbeautiful.net, from David McCandless. He has a terrific book on the same subject. And, and, and basically, you know, this, you know, this is, if you if, um, come global warming, you know, this is how... Um, affecting uh, th this is you know the effect that ra rising um, ocean levels will actually have on various cities, uh, and what will you know uh, which, which cities are, are most at risk. Uh, on the right is something my eldest daughter did on uh, various things um, on uh, uh, data visual visualization relating to various characters and things that you can collect uh, in the very popular game Animal Crossing. One more from Menard, his most famous map to modern readers is this one, which details Napoleon's disastrous Russian campaign of 1821. And you look at this initially and, you know, sort of, well, what's going on here? It, it, it looks like, you know, essentially two main types of lines, one in sort of a, a, a beigey color and then a one in black. And sort of like, is that a river there somewhere in the middle? Is that a couple of rivers? And... You know what? What's going on here? Well, it's one of it, it's interesting because it really includes a whole bunch of different information, if you will, like different axes of information at different points within this particular graph. So what this is is that is actually showing the march of Napoleon's Grand Armée to Moscow, and then the road back from Moscow to France. So here, this is the size, the relative size of the Grand Armée as it crosses the Neman River into Russia, into Russia with a total of 400, 422,000 trips. And then the map progresses. And as you can see, the size of the Grand Armée dwindles as it gets closer and closer to Moscow. And here's one of the numbers. So, so again, you know, 440,000 started out. By this point, by the time they hit um, uh, uh, v uh, Vitebsk, they've, uh, they have a total of 175,000 troops left. And again, you know, this is due to a disease. Now, now some, some of the troops have actually been diverted. They've been set up, they're setting up fortifications and such, but, but many of the losses are due to, you know, the privations of war, not enough food, um, um, not enough medical support, and you know, so the by this time, you know, the, the size of the army has been whittled down substantially, and going through you know occasional ma you know major battles such as the, as, as the one at Smolensk uh, on the way there, so that reduced the size of the army to 145,000, and also natural challenges like rivers, which r whittled down the numbers further, because of course you know in some cases the bridges had been blown, and perhaps the troops had a ford. The river, um, and you know, sadly, not everybody made it. With only, in the end, a hundred thousand men, so you know, less than a quarter of the men reaching Moscow from you know the over four hundred thousand that initially set out from France. So here we are at Moscow. So that's the first sort of beige line. Then we have in black 
for fairly obvious reasons, the, the retreat. So then we have the city of Toronto. So we're going we're going back across across Russia, and as you can see, the number of troops dwindle further. So here we have eighty seven thousand on the right, and then uh, dwindling past uh, after after going through the town of uh, of, of Wisma, uh, Wisma, fifty five thousand, and further. Again, coming back to Smolensk, and further. And here we see these troops that were stationed at the Polotsk that are rejoining the main group. Oh man, another typo. Okay, so uh, you know, I, I, I need to do my own uh, uh, typo checking. My apologies. But anyways, they're rejoining the main group, and they all cross the Berezina River. So at this point, the, the black line actually gets a little bit thicker, which is, which is you know, good news, to, I guess, to a point. So now they're back up to 50,000 troops. But again, crossing, um, uh, crossing the Stu uh, Studienska River, they're now down to the, um, sorry, they, after crossing through the town of uh, Studienska and crossing the Berezina River, they're now at 28,000. Menard also knows specific points on the map, such as this one. Um, uh, where, we, where it then hits down to 12,000 troops. Looking at things like the recorded temperature that the troops also faced. So this is minus 30 degrees Celsius. Yeah. So you look at something like this, and you see why the numbers are going down, because now we're not just talking starvation, but, you know, essentially the troops are freezing to death. Until finally... Only 10,000 of the original 422,000 troops recross the Neiman River and back into France. The relative thickness of the lines tells a story that mere numbers alone cannot. And Edward Tuft, who we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, said that you know he considers this perhaps the best statistical graphic that's ever been drawn. And you're wondering who this is? This, you know, this map was then highlighted in Tuff's landmark book called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, dating back to 1983. And this book and his subsequent titles were absorbed and referenced specifically by a new generation of UI designers, which leads us to really a landmark in um, the establishment of how computer user interfaces um, can work, which is the Macintosh Human Interface Guidelines from 1993. And this popularized UI design theories, which are still, still used today, such as the idea that you can you know, have direct manipulation. You can actually, in this case, say, drag a file from one area to another by essentially, in this case, by, you know, physically, supposedly, like using your mouse and clicking on it and then moving it, much as you might do with, say, something like, say, a light switch. More on this in, you know, next weekend and upcoming weeks. Okay, so that covers off the first part of, of, of this, of, you know, of the various things that an IA, um, you know, the, the role of what an IA can do. The second part is a person who creates a structure or map of information which allows others to find their personal past to knowledge. When you think of that, that actually sounds, you know, in some ways, uh, uh, kind of like you know, how to find information on a website. And that's pretty much exactly what we're applying it to. Now, it's worth knowing that, you know, back in the time when Orman was talking about this sort of thing, um, you know, there, there was really not much of a web to talk about. Um, when I was doing my master's degree uh, in the last century, <clears throat> I used um, this to do research online. This was, in, you know, chances are nobody here has, has actually used this, and why would you? This is uh, what's known as Gopher. And this was a way to access online resources, primarily at various academic institutions and libraries, where you could then, you know, do um, text-based searches um, and then get, you know, text-only um, uh, results back. So in some ways, it was kind of the first search engine, but without any images and... Uh, yeah, well, you know, this is sort of the, the, the green phosphor screen thing. Yeah, that was uh, very much uh, a thing of the time. And <laughs> I, I, I definitely used uh, screens exactly like this uh, way, way back in the day. Um, but then along back, you know, back in 1990, Tim Berners-Lee came up um, with the HTTP protocol, which in turn 
helped launch uh, the World Wide Web. And, and of course, you know, he, he's uh, uh, someone who was working at uh, the laboratory in CERN, and the original idea was to help um, CERN uh, and other like institutions to sort of spread their information um, around. Um, you know the re research papers and, and information which may include images, for example. So you know this. So that started the idea of the you know uh, the hypermedia browser. So here is in fact a picture of uh, the very first web browser you know uh, use, which was called Viola, and it used hyperlinks, allowing the user to uh, <coughs> surf. That's a term you don't hear very much anymore. Surf where they wanted, and it was the first internet application to incorporate images. So back in 1996, the web was then opened up for commercial use. So prior to that, it was purely um, for um, for non-commercial ventures, primarily academic, but also military. But, but you know, mainly primarily academic. And here is you know here's a look at various commercial websites, circa 1996. So you know there's there's a there's an example of the Apple website top left. Uh, Hotwired, which is the um, the website for Wired Magazine's website back then, uh, the Yahoo website as it appeared back in '96, and uh, the website that I uh, knew quite well, the Del Reno website, and and FTP because you know FTP was was pretty darn important file transfer protocol for getting getting files, and um, as you can see, it was um, uh, pretty clear that web designers needed help. <laughs> So, and just a little bit about the, you know, like this, this is exactly how many websites looked. Um, you know, you know what, what do those things in the, in the center part of the page look like? Well, you know, the idea was that they hopefully looked like buttons that people could then be imper encouraged to, to press. And, uh, um, you know, because the graphic designer at the time had a, a bunch of different, um, you know, and then for the time, cool-looking textures. It's like, hey, let's use these textures on these button-like objects. And uh, the reason why the things uh, and the the buttons at the bottom are misaligned is that there was no way to properly, um, you know, align things. Uh, in fact, the um, the initial part of the image is um, is essentially a rectangle from the. Uh, that is a, a three by by three uh, re uh, rectangle, and then FTP calendar and help were then uh, added to it uh, rather haphazardly, and it sort of grew in that way. Oh, yeah, this is these are things you don't have to worry about anymore, and 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 thank the Lord for that. But as you can see, you know, going halfway to meet the needs of the users was you know something that needed to be worked on, and you can, it's very, it's clear from something when you look at something like this. And you know, here is you know, and, and you can't see me, but I'm I'm sort of like you know scratching my head at this point. This is another another website that I that I that I worked on, but um, uh, let's just say that it was um, driven more by marketing than by um, uh, common sense or good sense. And you know, this was uh, the Del Rena's version of a um, a website so to support their web browser and related technologies, and they came up with the. Um, Silver Surfer idea. Gee, I wonder where they got that idea from. Uh, no, I'm <clears throat> uh, and they came up with a circular-looking um, interface because um, that's what everybody uses, right? Um, yeah. Okay. No. 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 Definitely not. Here is the Semantic website. When Semantic then bought out Delrina, and I had a chance to work on. What was essentially the first um, amalgamated version of the semantic website back in the um, late 90s, um, and you know by this point we we come up with the idea of having something like a navigation bar at the top, where people could then sort of you know click on things like global sites and products, shop semantic, and so so they could then you know identify you know specifically what what they were trying to find, and you know navigate hopefully more effectively. Um, below, there's also the option to um, surf the content of the website using different languages, and then and then also there's information, as you can see, spread around everywhere else, talking about the latest news, and also you know what was called quick links, which was you know information that you know we thought was going to be the mo you know of most interest to the people coming to the website. So you know. Uh, there's a definite evolution going on, and, and I think it's safe to say that this is very much an improvement over the previous two websites that, that you've seen. 
And by the way, at this point, I need to point out that the images from these old websites are courtesy of the Wayback Machine, um, which is a part of the Internet Archive website. So if, um, and I mention this because it may be very useful for you to take a peek at the um, development of previous versions of the targeted websites that you will be uh, taking on and analyzing, because this will give you a sense as to you know what they you know the designs and and how they tried to reach out to users in the past. So, for example, in this particular case, I'm showing you um, in the lower left uh, the very simple looking uh, uh, web page, the main page for the Royal Ontario Museum website, dating back to 1996. In fact, that's one of the first entries that you can see on the on the Wayback Machine. If you're interested, um, just go, just do a Google search for Wayback Machine. It'll take you right to it, and then type in the URL of the website that you're interested in to sort of get an idea as to how it's evolved over time. Two seminal books that helped focus web design um, user experience came out in the late '90s. So there's the you know the first edition of the Polar Bear book from 1998. And then there's also Jacob Nielsen's Designing Web Usability that came out in 1999. And there were other books, um, but these two are really in some ways, you know, like the, the, the core um, of, of the, of the book, books and designs that, that, uh, that came out that, 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 looked at the sub, that looked at the subject. So the, the Polar Bear book, and I realize this, this says the third edition, but essentially it's the same cover as, as what appeared in the first one, talked about the practice of IA for the web, provided practical strategies for IAs to follow, emphasized um, a user-centric focus, so, you know, essentially the idea that information architects are there to advocate on behalf of the user, and it also examined ways to organize content, labeling systems, navigation, and search. This, the book by Jacob Nielsen, further uh, emphasized user-centric design and provided information on common user behaviors relating to the web, based on, on case studies and uh, experimentation. Uh, it also uses ex uh, user experience case studies to better define problems um, that are encountered by users, and also uh, developed a heuristic approach for working with types of information design issues. So in other words, if you came up, if you found you're in a novel situation, well, here is a systematic way to tackle that problem and hopefully to come up with a solution that works. Nielsen went on to co-found the Nielsen Norman Group, who are IA consultants who regularly publish articles based on their own, um, you know, fresh research on um, user experience, user-centric design, usability, and, and more. Highly recommended. Again, uh, I mentioned this earlier with the YouTube channel. Uh, the articles are, you know, almost always terrific and, and well worth having a look at. So. Much of the current practice of IA is derived from these two books and some of the successors, uh, which, which you see here. Um, most practitioners I've met are very familiar with the Polar Bear book in particular and its successors. Okay, now let's have a look at the third part of uh, Saul Worman's definition of an IA. The tw in the emerging 21st century professional occupation, addressing the needs of the age focused upon clarity, human understanding, and the science of the organization of information. So when I worked as a consultant, I would typically do the following. I would do things like interview stakeholders, analyze the existing websites, review the content, and say, you know, devise new structures. I'd also aid firms moving from unstructured to structured content, and as I mentioned you know, previously, my expertise is in a format known as DidXML. I'd also advise clients on the best content management systems for their needs and advise IAs on best practices. I also work on things like a unified content strategy involving such things as semantic analysis of existing content, taxonomic creation, uh, style guides, so on and so forth. The point being is that there's a lot that can be done with a foundation in information architecture. So as information becomes a pervasive part of our lives, we essentially become the browser. And the information we move through is not a web, but the virtual and the real coming together in, in some, you know, in a real, very, very real way, in fact, merging. One example of this is a proposed standard called um, uh, IIRDS, which is part of what's known as an Industry 4.0 initiative. 
and um, this is actually um, out out of Germany uh, primarily. So, uh, um, and and essentially the idea is is that for um, creating um, Things like um, well, like 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 various uh, large um, industrial objects, such as say engines or or you know um, um, uh, processing plants or what have you, that you may in fact have an individual part that exists in the real world, but then there would be the equivalent of essentially as you see here a, a digital twin, which contains the metadata that describes that particular object, and that the idea is that you can then uh, you know have various real objects and have essentially um, uh, virtual information that is all, you know, essentially always attached to it. And if you're wondering what you know, Industry 4.0 is, here is sort of an overview um, of, of the idea. As it says here, Information 1.0 would be one format, one owner, one delivery, one publisher, and that would be you know, typically a, a particular you know, book of instructions, for example. And then from Information 2.0 would be, say, many, many formats, one owner, one delivery, one publisher, and then you might, you know, that would be, say, particular topics that'd be pushed out um, to various types of platforms, such as, say, a tablet or perhaps a printed documentation or PDFs and so on. Information 3.0, again, many formats, many owners, many deliveries, and one publisher. So, again, you're getting things like, um, you know, a content management system, so, you know, in this case, essentially a CRM. Um, and then you have a database that supports that. Then you have a portal, such as, you know, like a web portal. You may have embedded help. You may have a knowledge base and also getting feedback from users, all of which essentially interact um, with, you know, various aspects of these components. And, you know, essentially people get, you know, work with these and it evolves over time. Information 4.0 is going, you know, a step further. Many formats, many owners, many deliveries, and many publishers. Um, you know, and, and essentially at this point things are much more fragmented. You have, um, you know, individual what are known as content objects, that may be assembled into a virtual product because maybe you have a feature which is described for one particular product um, and it turns out that that same um, feature is used in, in a similar uh, product and you essentially take that version or perhaps a variant of that and then you put that put that and all of the information cobbled together over various different products into a new virtual product. And, you know, you can also use not just things like, say, um, websites to present this information, but you also may have, you know, things like, say, chatbots and so forth that also uh, pot potentially pre present this information. So, so the idea is, you know, breaking down content, in this case, to smaller and smaller pieces and then presenting it to, you know, more, uh, more and different types of platforms. So content strategy for something like Industry 4.0, you know, here's an example. Consider a device built from many parts from many different factors of uh, manufacturers such as say a train diesel engine Ideally for maintenance purposes. It requires a manual that documents all of its component parts made by multiple manufacturers This is where the IRDS standard can step in creating as it says a dynamic documentation that can be assembled according to application and content so content strategists are needed to create applicable taxonomies to make this happen and you know, this is the exact, exact same sort of thing that information architects also do. Essentially, this is information architecture, except applied, in this case, to virtual forms of content. So at this point, you're probably wondering, what the heck is content strategy? Well, and, and you know, uh, there's several different definitions for it. So Christina Halverson, um, who is, you know, basically known as the, the mother of uh, uh, content architecture, you know, describes it as the planning for the creation, delivery, and governance of useful, usable content. Margot Blumstein says it's the planning for the creation, aggregation, delivery, and useful governance of useful, usable, and appropriate content in an experience. And then Michael Brenner has a slightly different take where he says a content strategy is, you know, flips the tables on traditional linear marketing by defining the process and then securing the right resources for producing a consistent stream of content mapped to buyer needs across all phases of the buying cycle. So that is very much like a, you know, very much a, a buyer slash, you know, sort of corporate focus, but which, you know, is, is not necessarily the same as the first two, but, but, you know, the other two can then also be seen as perhaps feeding into it. So different perspectives, but essentially all, you know, looking at different aspects of the same thing. And in the end, content strategy produces a unified voice, or as it should, 
again, you know, in all content uh, channels. So, you know, we're, we're not just talking um, about just uh, website development, though they, clearly that, that has a place here. Um, so we're talking about, you know, search engine optimization, that's what SEO is, uh, editorial information, so that applies, you know, not just to website content, but also to, you know, other peripheral content, such as perhaps brochures and marketing information. Social media, which is primarily, but not exclusively web-based. Taxonomy and classification, which again, is, you know, primarily focuses on web content, but then how can that be used you know, elsewhere um, in, in, again, things like, say, social media and, and, and related uh, related areas. So, so you know, th this is, you know, it's designed to be kind of a, a whole, you know, in some ways a holistic approach to how you tackle content, not just, not just on websites, but across um, the entirety of the organization, essentially, if things are, things are done, done properly. And what is it based on? You know, uh, from Rahel Bailey. Actually, uh, the, you know, if um, the, this is really the, you know, she's really in some in some ways sort of the the the, the, the queen of, of content strategy. Really, the first to come up with a book on a major book on the subject. And she calls it, you know, she basically calls it a repeatable system that governs the management of content throughout the entire life cycle. So it's remember what I was saying at the very beginning about information um, and you know user user experience. Um, being essentially a an ever evolving thing. Well, you know, we're talking about the entire life cycle. This is, you know, beginning to end of how information is provided and how to manage that information. So what does a content strategist actually do? And ultimately they provide a vision as to the messaging from a company and they set in place and then manage the process and roles to produce a unified voice for that company. And in my experience, IAs often come in to fix an existing situation, such often as consultants. That, so that has primarily been uh, what I have done within my career. So often I've, I've come in as the information architect, but then I, I end up doing more in what's known as the content strategy realm. And content strategists tend, however, to be more embedded and can make decisions on processes and roles. So IAs are often... Uh, as you say, independent consultants, but content strategists tend to be embedded with, within the system and help evolve the system from within. That's, that has generally been my experience um, uh, at, at uh, various, uh, various firms and also uh, with, with various other people that I've worked with in the past. This is essentially their experience as well. And here's the potential scope of work for a content strategist. I won't go through this in, in detail, but, you know, again, this is just to emphasize the fact that it's, you know, it's as an offshoot of information architecture, there's a lot more that can be done than just focusing on um, just on websites. That is, again, what we're going to be primarily doing within this course. But again, this is just to show you that, you know, there, there is more out there that, that, um, that the tools and processes that I'll be teaching can take you. Uh, in terms of the type of work that you can that you can do if you if you have an interest in following this further, so that's pretty much all I'm really going to talk about in terms of content strategy. I just sort of want to make people aware that this is you know an emerging field, and and essentially having said that, ultimately I really hope that at least some of you in this class uh, will work with and help guide the future evolution of information architecture. And so saying, that is it for this presentation. Thank you very much for sticking with this all the way through. And there again is my email address if you want to get in contact with me. And um, the next thing that I am hoping you will see will be uh, the actual live lecture. Um, the second half of this um, set of presentations um, for, for this particular course. Uh, where I'll be uh, at least starting off uh, initially looking at uh, the development of uh, human-computer interactions. So again, thank you very much, and um, I'll see you virtually.